All right, so before we get into anything about coding and such, um, this class is like 95% coding. Before we get into that, um, we're going to do a little bit of storyboarding, a little bit of brainstorming, getting ideas down on paper or uh, on a graph paper or on a napkin or, or wherever. Uh, a lot of the great ideas of modern technology came out uh, being written or scribbled on a napkin. Twitter, for example, uh, the group that formed Twitter, they were having coffee and then they wrote their ideas down on, on a napkin. Uh, you can actually go look at that napkin, a photo of the napkin uh, on the official Twitter like uh, About Us page. So uh, the idea for that app, that service, uh, came out in a napkin because people were brainstorming. I want a project that does this or does that. And originally Twitter came about because it was going to be like a new generation of SMS or text messaging. Back in the day, text messaging, when we had those old Nokia phones, those indestructible Nokia phones that had no good screen or anything, but it had a great game of Snake. Remember, you could uh, write messages quickly, and some people were so talented they could tap that out really fast. Well, the limitation of that was, uh, you know, 140 characters, the, the network was set up that it could send 140 character messages. Uh, Twitter then adopted that, then added pictures and video and other stuff. But the idea originally came out very, very simply. Well, for us, I've been saying since the beginning, we're going to create an app that is ultimately, from behind the scenes, an inventory tracking system, which sounds very boring. But it's going to be, uh, we're, we're making it funner uh, in terms of it being the comic book database. It's going to be an app where a person can uh, store comic books. Uh, so we need to decide what sort of data we're going to store, um, what functionality the app's going to have, and we need to take a step back oftentimes with any web project, um, any app, and sort of plan that a little bit before getting right into the code. Even though if we have, you know, the 600-page book memorized, that doesn't mean you know how to make an app. That means you know how to, you, you know how to regurgitate the code, but that doesn't mean you know how to put it together to a real <coughs> app. So what I want to do first here is a general idea in, in the form of a, of a wireframe of kind of planning out or mapping out what the app will do. Now I'm going to do this in, uh, on my computer and I'll give you this file when I'm done with it. And this could work just fine if I have pencil and paper, of course. I want to show off here our thousand dollar monitor that has a cool little pen where I can actually tap on the screen and do stuff like that. Wow. So uh, I want to draw a simple uh, wireframe. This is an idea of like, how is the app going to work? What's it going to do? So excuse my, my writing. I've been writing on computers way too long, and now I've lost the ability to write like a human. So uh, we're going to have a first starting welcome screen. Welcome screen. The app loads up. We can decide what happens on it, of course. But we're going to have a, a very first welcome screen that welcomes you to the app. Maybe a graphic of the app. Uh, maybe some quick blurb, animation, sound, something. Some sort of screen that the user sees first. You're going to have the option uh, to go to two particular screens from here then. On most apps, when you first start the app, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, your bank, etc., what are a couple of things you usually can do when you first launch it? Ever. Sign in or register. Exactly. So we have two possible things here. Sign up or register or log in. So we get to the uh, to that first uh, welcome screen. I've never used the app before. I need to sign up. I need to register to create an account. So there will be a screen dedicated to the registration process. Let's say, whoops, I didn't actually want to register. I already have an account. So obviously, we can go back. It's often very useful for um, um, user experience from a user experience point of view that as soon as you create an account, it gives you the option. You've created an account. Log in with it. So we will be able to go to the login screen from the sign up screen. We create the account, 
then okay, take us to log in. Great. Well, just like with sign up, if a person goes directly to log in, I don't have an account. So we can set it up that they go back to welcome or most likely go back to sign up or go to sign up to create a brand new account. This is how we're then figuring things out from the beginning without writing the code yet. This is what I would like to do. This is how I would like it to behave. I say, well, actually, that might be a little confusing. Maybe I don't want them to go from login to sign up. Maybe I want them to go back to welcome. Maybe if they missed some of my text or explanation <coughs> that you need to do X, Y, and Z, maybe they missed that, so it might be good to go back to welcome. What else did they miss? You might not know this until then you start to beta test. So obviously you cannot probably plan or figure out every aspect of an app at an early stage. But the more you kind of reason it out in the beginning, the better. Okay, so let's say from here uh, the person um, goes directly to log in or to sign up. So at this point then they're going to go to some screen of home. The main screen of the app. Obviously, you would not want people to get to home without um, having either created an account or logged in. So there should be no way to get to this screen besides sign up or log in. Makes sense, but obviously apps and software that makes sense, someone had to figure it out. So we are in charge of all aspects of those things. We can't assume anything. From the home screen, we could do a few different things. I want to have an options screen. For example, one of the things we can do in options is, um, you know, like delete account. I created this account. I'm saving stuff into the database. I'm saving the comics. Uh, I sold the collection. I don't have it anymore. Never mind. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna delete this account. I don't need it anymore. So we can have a delete. We can have a delete. We can have a delete option. Uh, let's say I want to switch between users. So, switch users. For some reason, maybe I need to log out. Well, switching users uh, perhaps makes sense if a user exists. But if I try to switch to a user that doesn't exist, they're going to need to go through that whole sign up process, right? So, maybe there's some sort of like log out. Log out. Log out. And log out, maybe we'll take them right back to welcome. Where then the person can um, sign up for their own account um, and then log in, and then they're in home and it's their account. Once they've got their own account, um, then we can have some sort of user switching system, which is technically different than you know creating the account and such. From this main home screen, if I keep saying, um, okay, it's going to be a database about uh, comics or a database about anything, what might be two common operations that you might do in any inventory system? Add. What's that? Add an, item. Add an item, sure. So we'll do save a comic. Anything else? Delete, search. I'm going to call it as view comic. And of course, search and such. Uh, we could put search in view, view comic or view comics, save a comic, All right? Store a comic, save a comic. Looks really bad right there, but that's, imagine that says search. Um, so save a comic, view a comic, uh, maybe we have delete, 
delete a comic. I'm uh, looking at a list of the comics. I'm searching for a specific one. I'm deleting one. Anything else that we can do with data? Add, delete, view. Sure. Uh, share is going to be advanced eventually, but I heard edit. Edit, yes. So these are common operations with any data. Save the data, uh, display the data, uh, edit the data, delete the data. Very common operations for any sort of database. In our particular case, they're going to be, it's going to be comic book data. And then a little bit advanced, a little, a little later on, you yeah. might have share. So we will integrate, actually, features of social media. Um, so sharing uh, our data, sharing the comic, sharing, um, sharing over to Twitter or to Facebook, etc. We will be able to connect to social networks. So um, we can probably figure out other things that we could do with this particular app. Um, anyone have any other ideas, maybe? Other ideas? What else might be fun to do in this kind of app? Leave comments. Comments, sure. So other people commenting, maybe? Comments? So I'll just put here ideas, more ideas we might get to. So comments. Reviews. What's that? Reviews. Comments, reviews, sure. Reviews. Anything else? Contact. What's that? Contacts. Contacts in, in terms of like contact someone? Contact us. Sure. Yeah. Contact. About purchase. Purchase. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We can do one. Um, locator. Well, find me a local comic shop. So different ideas about what then we can further figure out to add to the app. Now, obviously, in the beginning, the sky's the limit. I wanted to do this. I wanted to do that. And we should be able to do most of these things uh, based on the, the knowledge that we get in the class. Even if we don't cover something exactly like purchase comic, uh, I would guide us to a place where we can look. Where do I learn to do this? What are the resources available? What, how much more do I need to educate myself to do something? Uh, here's one that people always forget on every single thing, not just apps and stuff. On your own personal computer, backups. Right, you're on your own computer. You've got your whole life on your computer. Whoops, it crashes. You lost everything because you didn't make backups anywhere. So backups would be something to think about, saving our data, because in the beginning, the project will be completely local in that a person installs your app on their device, and then their whole collection is on their device. Unless we go further and set up some sort of server or cloud infrastructure, all of the data lives on the device. So if they switch to a new device, or uh, they lose this device, or they drop it in a lake, well, all of the data that was in that device is gone. So backups or cloud infrastructure. That's just a fancy way of saying, you know, internet connectivity. Uh, saving my data to the cloud, because, OK, look at this device. It's already a year old. It's junk. I want a new one for this year. So I get the new device. I need to transfer the data over to the new device, often through some sort of cloud infrastructure. So there's a lot to think about and to add to, um, to add to the project. And the part over here, plus a few things we will definitely do, and these other ones over here, depending on our time and speed of the class and such, we can often get to. But just be aware that at the moment, I cannot guarantee we will be able to do all of these items. We will definitely be able to do all of the uh, Im most important things. And most likely, as shown by previous semesters, we'll have comments, contact, um, locator. It depends on how much time we have and all of that. And oftentimes, the, the stuff about clouds, cloud infrastructure and backup, that's often the harder one to get to, because then that suddenly requires a whole server infrastructure with online security, authentication. Uh, and that usually, that's the part that's not free. Everything else over here is usually free. But when you start to talk about cloud infrastructure, that's going to be not free uh, to very not free. 
So this I'm going to put into the network folder a little bit later if you want a copy of this. Does this kind of make sense? Any ideas of what we're talking about? Any questions I mean about what we're talking about here? As I've said, uh, I've taught this class several times. Uh, the first version was back in 2013, I guess. So that's five years now. And every semester it, it improves, it gets upgraded, new technology comes out. Uh, one of the things that's kind of fun but also challenging with this world of apps is that it's always moving forward. There's always a new iPhone, there's always a new Samsung phone, there's always a new X, Y, and Z. There's always a new version of iOS, there's always a new version of the Android operating system, new technologies and so forth. So on the one hand, there's always something cool and new and interesting to do, and on the other hand, you never quite can, can finish because it's always uh, progressing. So people kind of say, uh, you know, an app is never finished, it's simply abandoned because what else is next? So um, we're going to work on this kind of project. And as I said, well, I've taught this class before, and uh, I know, like 99% sure, that the code that we're going to talk about works. And uh, not to be mean or anything, but if it doesn't work for you, it's probably your fault. Now, again, not trying to be mean, but what I'm trying to say is I've taught this class for five years. And I know that this code works. And I know that I've tested it on a variety of devices and on a variety of computers and people's own laptops and own devices. And 98% of the time it works. Sometimes when it doesn't work, oops, I mistyped semicolon instead of colon. Well, that's not my problem. You mistyped the semicolon. Other times, uh, my device doesn't work. I try everything to do and I just can't install it on my device. Well, it worked for everyone else in class, so it was your device. Obviously, I'm going to try to troubleshoot everyone as best as possible, but often, but sometimes, if it doesn't work, it, it doesn't work on your particular device, or you just need to take extra time to read and reread your code and retype it. It's been so many times that we type our code and someone just it doesn't work. So I said, okay, type it over. They delete it completely. They type it again, and then it works. There must have been like an apostrophe or something that didn't look like an apostrophe that they <coughs> missed. One character can break everything. Not one command. One character. A colon versus a semicolon can break the whole app. And uh, that's why I try to build in the last half hour or so of lab time for one-on-one -on -one help and such. And we haven't really needed it in the beginning, perhaps. But we'll definitely need it as time goes on. And if you're working at home, even better. Because then you can practice what we're doing here to make sure it works. And eventually you're going to be tested on these things that your code works. And they're really, this isn't a philosophy class in that, you know, what is truth? Your code works or it doesn't. The end. You get a result or you don't. So um, grading then is going to be very straightforward. It works or it doesn't. And I have the whole app right here. This is 1,000 lines of code. A little app. 1,000 lines is nothing in the bit in the grand scheme of it all, because things like you know, Windows is like 10 million lines of code, and yeah, a thousand people work on it. And for us, we have a goal. I know where it's going to end up, and it has worked in the past, and it'll continue to work. And of course, I'm happy to help as best as I can, and you're help and you're welcome to help each other and such. Uh, I just you know don't give your work to someone else because they're falling behind and they're not learning it. If you're helping each other during class, I just ask that you do it at a reasonable volume. So with that pep talk, we're going to start the project. We have enough of the knowledge that we can start to at least create the interface of things. Perhaps not yet the functionality. Perhaps not yet how do I create an account. But at least being able to create the screens and such. So we're going to spend a little time today first creating these various screens, and then we'll get to the functionality, basic, then intermediate, then advanced functionality. I'm going to put a copy of this graphic right now into the network folder if you want it. And then we're going to set ourselves up on our flash drive to um, create our work environment one moment. But let me put the copy of this wireframe into the network folder, it's called Wireframe. Uh, you can get a copy of it if you want, or if not, that's fine. And it'll be there the rest of the semester. But I want to set ourselves up. Every, by now, everyone should have a flash drive, or I guess if you're saving this stuff to Google Drive, 
that'll work just fine but you need some way to start saving your work and from now we will be working and reworking on the same code we started from the beginning a couple of times last class meetings and now we're gonna start with a project for real and keep it going throughout the length of the course so I ask in uh, your flash drive uh, however folder structure you have uh, to create a, a folder for the work and the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to create a folder with today's date with today's date um, because I will be putting a copy of my code into the network folder at the end of most class meetings except before there's a test I don't want to give you the answer of course but I'm gonna write the code and as we go on the folder is gonna have stuff in that in itself it's gonna have uh, HTML CSS JavaScript and graphics files and at the end of the day I'm gonna put a copy of my code unless otherwise noted so I've got a folder with today's date and let's open up notepad plus plus If you get the usual pop-ups here, you can uh, do the update or not. Doesn't matter because we've got deep freeze. Going to create a new file. I'm going to save this into the folder I just created, and with the file name index.html. Now, previously we've used a name that was the date, but from here on out, we're using a file name index.html. I'm putting index.html in the folder with today's date. That's going to change every day that we do a new lecture. Uh, and I'll show you how to do that uh, next time. But I want to have whatever, you're gonna, whatever your inclination of calling this, hold off and just call it index. The reason for this is eventually when we get this to be an, a real app, the device is going to expect that the first screen of your app is called index.html. And commonly, the first page of a website is also index.html. So just to keep it all simple, your file name is index.html in the folder 2018.02.13. Yes, and like I said, I'll explain that next time. So uh, we have our template file um, that we can get from the network folder if you want to do it the easy way. But it's not so much to write at this point, and it's good to do a little practice again. Obviously, you're not going to need to do this every single time. But we're going to create the usual simple skeleton HTML document. that we've seen before and you know we can use our template file that we've got in the network folder but where's the fun in that so you go. 10 lines of code that's all we really need at the moment I'm done how about you no okay I'll give you a couple more seconds Remember your pairs and lowercase and all that good stuff. Oh, and then that'll remind me when we get started in just a moment. I'll mention autocomplete in case you want it. But let's do these 10 lines. This is, this is enough as a starting quick little template to start our work. HTML, body, head, title, meta, and the doc type comments and such will come of course these thousand lines like I said I've got the old the whole app ready to go here I just need to feed it into the computer and it's ready to go like punch cards um, this also includes comments so it's not pure 1,000 lines of, of all the code it's also lines of comments because it's important to comment the code um, so let's uh, put those 10 lines up there then we'll get started you 
all uh, yes lowercase this is uh, for the cool new generation of apps that sometimes we have upper cases <coughs> and lower cases uh, so yeah CBDB <coughs> okay so we've been using notepad on purpose with autocomplete turned off so far Meaning that I have to remember, you have to remember, to type H1 and then eventually close H1. Well, oftentimes when you're using a civilized code editor, part of its purpose is to help you in terms that it will autocomplete. Um, it will close the tags for you or it will close the pair of things. So eventually when we do something like, you know, prompt, don't write this prompt whatever and and I don't and I forget to close my parenthesis it won't work so even pairs of things like that obviously you, you have to close those pairs so we're gonna turn on I'm gonna show you how to turn on the autocomplete and if you want to use it you can no there will be no demerits for that that's perfectly fine and in the real world I would usually have this turned on because even though I've had practice for I don't know like 17 years making apps uh, web projects I sometimes find it very helpful to it close a thing for me because I don't want to forget. So the way we would turn on autocomplete in Notepad++, if you go up to Settings, you go to Preferences. I believe if you install Notepad++ at home, you I think it turns it on automatically. But here's a place where you could turn it on or off and set other settings if you want. So let's check this out. Go to Settings, Preferences. And then on the left, auto completion. At the moment, it's all turned off. Just to practice, just to try it out a little bit. Turn on, enable auto completion on each input function and word, function parameter hint. Yeah, turn that on. Open and close parentheses. Open and close square brackets. Open and close curlies. Open and close double quotes. Open and close single quotes. Open and close HTML. So. We were doing it the, the hard way, in that you needed to remember to always close every pair. And that's fine, you may like that. And you can turn some of these on, or all of them, or whatever, if you want a little help. Um, when I code with Notepad, I often have all of them turned on, and sometimes I just uh, turn on my pairs of those. Sometimes that's enough, and then the others I do manually. So it just depends how you want to do it. But now the point is, when you turn all of those on and you click close, now as I start writing H1, it's also going to start to pop up saying, you might mean this code. I do mean H1. And when I close that, it closed its pair. And if you're writing something else like script, don't write this, I'm just showing. But as you're starting to write something, it might then pop up and say, do you mean scope? Do you mean section? Do you mean scope? If you're writing the A tag, and then that needs an href, you know, it may pop up. What you can do with these pop-ups is you can double-click the suggestion, and it finishes writing it for you. Or you can press tab. At, uh, like right here, I'm starting to type href, and I'm type hr, so it thinks, do you want hr? No, I want href. So since my hand is already on the keyboard, I can press up and down on the arrow keys, then enter, and it finishes it for me. So a lot of code editors are like this nowadays, that you start writing and then it suggests to you. It can be very helpful. On mine, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it off because I, I never remember to turn it on when I come into class. You're gonna need to turn it on yourself every time you come in, because remember, deep freeze. Any changes you make to our computer will not save when you restart the computer. And I never remember to turn it on in class, so mine's always off. If you want to turn yours on, you can do so. So what I want to do here is set up a project that is going to be multi-screen in our graphic about what we what our app is going to be we had a welcome screen <coughs> we had the um, uh, login screen sign up screen etc we had different screens a, a uh, multi-page app right 
so that means jQuery Mobile. When we first worked with jQuery Mobile, we connected to the jQuery Mobile files that were online. And then our project worked. We had multi pages with section, page ID, uh, pay, uh, data role equals X. Well, the big problem with that, a few of you had asked, well, um, those files are on the internet. What happens if I don't have an internet connection? It's true. Then our jQuery mobile powered app would not work if they don't have an internet connection. So if our app is on their device and they're in a tunnel and they have no Wi Fi, simply the interface will not work. Big drawback. So what we're going to do is we're going to download the jQuery mobile files and put them into our projects folder. Uh, so this project folder, I want to download the jQuery mobile files and put them in here. So let's go over to the website jQueryMobile.com. I'll show you what you need to download. We're gonna we're gonna save offline uh, versions of the jQuery mobile files so that the person is not reliant on an internet connection simply for the interface. That's too much of a catastrophic failure that even the interface doesn't work if they're not online. So we're going to download the latest stable version which is all of the code but there is a custom download version that you could play with uh, meaning the latest stable version that we're going to get has all of the jQuery mobile code, even for things we might not even use. So it's going to be a little bit more space and resources that the app takes. If you want a super streamlined, super efficient version of the app, you will need to go on your own over to the custom download and pick only the components of jQuery mobile that you want. For simplicity, we're going to get the whole thing, which is not that big. It's like a quarter of a megabyte. <clears throat> and once the app is compressed, it's even smaller. <clears throat> but let's go to latest stable. You should then automatically, well, I'm in Opera, so it automatically downloaded. <clears throat> if you're an Internet Explorer or Firefox or something else, it might say, what would you like to do with this file? Save it or download it? You want to download it. Once it downloads, you get a zip file. That's exactly what I said. If you get Save As, you click Save As, and that will download. So once it downloads, uh, you you get this zip file, and uh, the zip file needs to be unzipped. All of the supporting files are compressed. They're not ready to be used. There's several files in here, actually, so they're all compressed into one. You want to right-click, extract. Yes. When you're on the Mac, oftentimes a zip file unzips itself in, straight into your Downloads folder. Here on Windows 7, uh, mine downloaded to the desktop, and I need to right-click and extract all. We need to download inside our folder. Is it file? Not exactly, because um, we need files that are inside of this zip file. So you could download it directly to your flash drive, but not into the folder. That's a good point. So I'm not exactly downloading my zip file into the, the, the 0213 folder yet. I need some of the files in the zip file but you just need to download the whole zip file first, somewhere like to the desktop. I've downloaded it to the desktop. I'm going to right-click Extract. This is extracting 17 megabytes, but we don't need all of that. I'll show you exactly what you need in a moment. When I download the zip file and I extract it, I then get a folder full of all of these files. 
we only need a few of these files. At the end of the list, we've got uh, jQuery Mobile dot min dot css jQuerymobile dot min dot js we need those two files as well as dot min dot map so from my zip from my zip folder I need to drag a copy of the of the last three files basically everything else is redundant we only need these last three ones jQuerymobile one four five min css jQuery Mobile 145 min JS, jQuery Mobile min map. These three files, put them into the same folder as your index file in the 213 folder. So not, not to extract all or extract all and copy three? Extract all and then copy three. So I need these three files as well as the image images folder. That's where the icons that come with jQuery Mobile are stored. Into the folder of your project. So the one with today's date. So these three files plus the images folder, all of them go into the same folder where my index is at, the 2018-02-13 folder on your flash drive. Let's pause right there. Does everyone have that in there? Anyone having a little trouble? Should we keep other items <coughs> on our flash drive or
Okay, so these are the supporting files for our project. Previously, we were connecting to these files on the internet, meaning that the person would need to have an internet connection for our project to work. But now, because we've all put these supporting files into our project folder, the person doesn't need an internet connection anymore. The basics of the app will work because it's included in the project file. Well, what we still need to do then in our HTML file is connect to those, uh, to those files, uh, the CSS and the JavaScript. But there was one more file that I have mentioned that is very popular that other libraries build on top of. Anyone remember that one? There's one underlying that oftentimes other JavaScript libraries build on top of. I think I heard someone say jQuery. Yes, that's right. <laughs> jQuery. jQuery is what we need. Right now we're using jQuery Mobile. jQuery Mobile works by working on top of jQuery, so to speak. So we also need to download the jQuery file. Back to the web browser. If you, if you notice, jQuery Mobile says version 145 works with jQuery 1.8 or 2.1. So we need to get one of those versions of jQuery. And actually, jQuery mobile is part of the whole, part of the whole um, family of libraries, meaning right over here, you can go directly to jQuery right there. We're in the jQuery mobile project. We need to go to jQuery, and we need to go find a copy of the jQuery library that it's asking <coughs> us. Uh, it says either version 1.8, 1.11, or 2.1. The latest version that it's saying right here is 3.3, so that won't that one won't quite be compatible uh, with what we need. So we need to find a version that jQuery Mobile says is compatible. So click on the download jQuery, but then we're going to go at the very end of the document all the way to the end, past releases or other versions. So under past releases, click on all past releases found in the jQuery CDN. So jQuery is very popular. Uh, it's a very popular JavaScript library that many other projects then build themselves on top of. So that's why we also need jQuery. And there is a version of jQuery 1x, 2x, and 3x. So you might say, well, I'm going to get the latest one, because the latest is the greatest. Um, yes and no, sometimes that, that's true. But other times, uh, depending on what the library that you're using, what it requires is what you should use, not just the latest version. Uh, so we've got uh, the note is 1.8, 1.11, or 2.1. So that's a 2.2, and that's a 1.12. So these aren't the right ones yet. You've got over here, see all of the versions. 1.12 will work, right? No, it just said 1.11 or 2.1 or 1.8. Or, or it's all. So we're going to then click on see all versions of jQuery core right here. Then when we scroll down, we'll find the one we're looking for, which is, uh, I think we'll go with 2.1, 2.1, what did it say, Two, yeah, 2.10. So once you look through here, yeah, there's 2.11 and 1.2 and 1.4, but just to be safe, uh, we have two possible ones here under 2.0, uncompressed or minified. Uh, we want the minified version, which is pretty unreadable, but we don't ever have to read these files. We just have to use them. Uh, so under <coughs> 210, uh, let's choose to download the minified version. I think you'll have to right click and select uh, something like save linked file as or save linked content 
as you want to save this file if you if you simply click on it I think it's just going to show you the raw code or something else so you want to right click save link contact as and so here it's going to ask to save this file uh, and you can go ahead and save it into your project folder so that then we could integrate it into our project. Save, save <coughs> so you want to make, yes. Yeah, I'm getting a, just to save the link, but not to save the target. Uh, which browser are you using? Uh, Chrome. Save link as. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't know it does that. All right, so you want to have all of those files in your project folder. The index file, of course, because um, that's where uh, the interface will exist. The CSS file for jQuery Mobile, that's the, the colors and the basic design. The jQuery Mobile JS, the JavaScript, the basic, jo uh, the basic JavaScript aspects. Uh, map file, don't worry about that just yet. That's a little complex, just don't worry. And then jQuery, because all of these other jQuery mobile files expect that your project has basic jQuery. All of the images and um, animation um, loader is in the images folder. So this is our project so far. We are setting ourselves up to be able to use jQuery and jQuery mobile to start to build this project. You can close your web browser if you want. If you got all the right files, you can close that and we'll go back to Notepad. I want to add the um, I want to add the connection or the link to those files like we did last time and I want to add the mobile friendly meta tag so that it's responsive so that it looks good on a mobile device so right after your meta your first meta tag right there we're gonna add another meta tag this one was um, meta um, name and content so we saw we added this meta tag so that the project is responsive on different devices uh, what we are targeting is the viewport and the content is the various levels of zoom and all of that uh, so we have initial scale equal to 1 comma user scalable no and width equals device dash width After this, then we uh, connect over to the 
um, jQuery mobile CSS file. Like last time when we created our <coughs> jQuery mobile project, we had connections to one CSS file and two JavaScript files. So on the next line, still inside of the head, well actually let's put it after title. So a new line after title, we need here a link which needs an href. Well, actually, we did first a, a rel, and then an href. So we're going to link to a CSS file. The relationship between this file and, and this link is a style sheet, and then a link to the style sheet file. rel is style sheet. And last time with href, we wrote the whole address, http colon code dot jQuery dot com slash blah, blah, blah. We've got the file, or you should have the file, in this folder. In this folder, this project folder, you should have your index file and your CSS file. So all that we do have to do is to simply uh, say the name of that file in the href. We don't need the HTTP anymore because it's not online. That's good. We no longer need an internet connection for some of the basic functionality of our project to work. What's the question? Yes. Yes, so either you know how to copy a file, or you don't, or you write it by hand. So then, um, we need then the connection to the style, the style sheet file, um, where we did that last time in the body. We're going to have a connection to a file of, of JavaScript. So I'm going to source. And that one was, oh, actually with the jQuery first and then jQuery mobile. So that one is called. jQuery dash two dot one dot zero. So because of the order of this stuff matters, we have to first load the definitions or the code of jQuery. Then the next line, <coughs> we load the jQuery mobile. It should, yes. I was about to copy and paste the mistake, sorry. Very good point. Someone's keeping me awake. Yes, script, sorry about that. I was just thinking about uh, the CSS file and I wrote style. Yes, it's a script. It's JavaScript, so there's a source to our JS file. And then there's also the the link over to the jQuery mobile JavaScript file. very least to see if this is working properly then we'll take a break uh, if you write you know h1 uh, CBDB 
and you view it in your browser we're still going to be testing this in a browser of course we're not there yet testing on a real device yet um, but at the very least if you save if you write this code and all of the files are in the right place at the very least what it should look like is remember the the colors change a little bit the font changes it should the text should not be pure black it's a little bit off black the background should not be pure white it should be grayish and it's okay if your text is right next to the edge if it doesn't look like this if the colors look right but your font is wrong that probably means your connection to your css file is wrong if your font looks right but your colors look wrong then there's might be another wrong bit of code at the bottom so at the very least this is what we need here we're going to do our first break <coughs> We're going to do our first break right now, um, and if it works, great. Take a little break. If it didn't, call me over. It's about 7.05. We'll take a break until 7.15, and then we'll go on.